coming back. Um, this afternoon we're going to have a series of three talks by uh, the people that were uh, really fundamental to the design of IOTAS, both hardware and software. So it'll be really interesting to see some of the capabilities of the board that you've put together. And um, hopefully this will be interesting for people who didn't uh, do the assembly project as well. So if you're just interested in um, microcontrollers in general, but particularly the ESP32, which is pretty much the new hotness following on from the ESP8266, I think this will be really interesting. So first up, we're going to have Angus talking about the ESP32. Thanks, Angus. Thanks, John. So uh, just before I start talking about the ESP32, which is the microcontroller in the IOTAS project that everybody's just built, or some of you have just built, I, I just want to echo John's thanks to the organizers for the Miniconf today who really put in a hell of a lot of hours. Uh, my involvement this year has been fairly limited, but um, Andy and Mark have done a great job working on software for weeks at a fairly short time frame. And Bob and John have both done a really incredible job, especially considering they both have uh, children under the age of one of uh, designing and building a hardware project on a fairly short time frame with fairly new hardware. Um, so i take, take the time to thank both them and I think probably their significant others who probably put up with allowing them the time to uh, get this project down the, across the line. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about the ESP32 microcontroller. And like John suggested, this is a follow-on from the ESPA266 that came out a couple of years ago, back in 2014. Uh, this caused a bit of a stir in hobbyist circles, a lot of interest. Um, it's quite a powerful processor. It's got an 80 megahertz, 32-bit core. It's got Wi-Fi built in. It's got about 100 k of RAM, different kinds of 150 k of RAM, different kinds of RAM. It's got a few external peripherals. You can hook a whole lot of stuff up to it. Uh, it's a little bit unusual. The processor architecture isn't AVR or ARM, which a lot of people are probably used to. It's an Extensa 32-bit processor, uh, but you can still use GCC to compile C for it. So you can use it in most of the same ways that you'd use a, an ARM core. Um, it's made by a sort of small company called Espressive, and the real reason why it really got took off is that it was really, really cheap, um, less than a couple of US dollars, and you could get one of those. So. Last year's Open Hardware Miniconf project, for people who didn't see that one, was called ES Plant, and that was an ESP8266 based uh, garden monitor, sort of weather controller or general purpose board. And also last year, uh, I gave a talk, just a quick to introduce myself. At the time, I was a community member, embedded developer, working on some open source projects to do with the ESP8266 and open source software. Um, I gave that talk last year. This year, my situation's changed a little bit, just to explain. Uh, as of mid-year, I work for Expressive Systems, and I'm paid to mostly work on open source <coughs> projects, which is fantastic. I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, correlation here does not imply causation. Uh, it's just a happy thing that Expressive decided to do this, and that I got to get on board and help with that. <coughs> so the ESP32 is the next generation chip from the ESP8266. It was announced about a year and a half ago, and it's been available patchily for about the last three months. Uh, this picture is a module that incorporates the ESP32 with some of the supporting components to make it go. So you can solder that down onto a PCB. That's the ESPW Room 32. And that's what we used on IOTAS. Uh, actually, I should also mention here that uh, Espressive were kind enough to donate the ESPW rooms that we have on those boards, which was great because they're kind of hard to get hold of at the moment. A similar CPU to the ESP8266. Um, the main processor in the ESP32 is also an Extensor 32-bit processor. It's a little bit beefed up. It's a uh, dual core. The cores can run at up to 240 megahertz each. Uh, I think the calculation is 600 dry stone MIPS of processing power. Uh, it has hardware floating point unit. It has a fairly large CPU fetch pipeline. So it's got a seven-stage pipeline, which is unusual in microcontrollers, but it's usually microcontrollers that have to run at 240 megahertz. That's to do with how many instructions can be queued up in the pipeline to run on the CPU. And it's necessary to get good performance at high clock rate if your memory is not particularly fast. So to compare this to sort of previous generation chips, the, an 8-bit AVR has a two-stage pipeline. Uh, a 486 desktop CPU has a five-stage pipeline. Um, there are some extra instructions for doing some DSP-like operations. You can do 
in multiplication and division in a single cycle. Um, and there's some built in, it's actually not in the CPU, but there's some support for accelerating uh, cryptographic operations because that was one of the things on ESP8266. If anybody tried to bring up a TLS connection or something, it was pretty slow. So there's been an effort to make that uh, perform a bit better. And as well as that dual core CPU, uh, there's a whole other ultra low power code processor that is really, really basic, but allows you to wake up out of deep sleep without starting your CPU maybe talk to some sensors or something and decide whether you have to wake up the big CPU so you can save power by doing that. The ultra low power one is a homebrew design from Espressive, so it doesn't use an established instruction set. Uh, there's a very simple assembler for it available at the moment and there's gonna be a bin utils like normal GCC assembler available soon. So we'll be able to program with that. One of the things to mention about the CPUs is that uh, there are actually quite a lot of these kind of Wi-Fi modules or Wi-Fi devices or particularly network devices that use a dual CPU in a little package for an embedded device. Usually one of the CPUs is reserved for the network stack and the Wi-Fi and you can't usually program it. It's a closed black box and the other CPU is available. One of the unusual things about ESP32 is that you can put your code to run on both processes as you want. So you can choose to have Wi-Fi on one core and your stuff on the other core or you can choose to put everything on one core and if you've got one particular bit of essential code, you can put that on the other core. Or you can have uh, tasks scheduled on both of the cores as you sort of want. So there's a lot of flexibility there in how you decide to use dual cores. The amount of storage has gone up. Anybody who worked with ESPA266, especially if you used like a language like Lua or JavaScript or even Python, it's probably used to running out of memory. Um, you kind of write the code you wanted and you run out of memory and then you'd spend the next day shrinking it so that it would run without using too much memory. So that limit has gone up quite a lot. You have uh, half a megabyte of memory. You can have quite a lot of external flash. And I say from experience, that's pretty nice. You don't have to kind of worry about your overheads quite as much as you did before. The chip still does Wi-Fi built in. Um, has the 802.11 BGNN that the ESPA266 had. So has 802.11e, which is a real-time media streaming extension for doing real-time signaling. The Wi-Fi also now supports uh, HT40, so you can push more uh, throughput over the network. Uh, but the really big improvement in wireless is that there's also a Bluetooth stack now. So uh, Bluetooth 4.2 does classic Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy. At the moment, I think there's only software support for uh, BLE, but there is going to be classic support for uh, classic Bluetooth, I believe, like audio, networking profiles, all that kind of thing. And you can run the Wi-Fi stack and the Bluetooth stack at the same time. Another thing that kind of probably, if anybody used an ESPA266, it didn't have a lot of analog features for like reading voltages and stuff like that. The ESPA266 had one ADC that could read up to 1.1 volt, uh, and even then only in certain circumstances. Um, the ESP32 has an 18 dual ADC with up to 18 channels, 12-bit uh, conversion, so you can read a lot of voltages uh, a lot easier than before, and they go to the full range of 3.3 volts, the same as everything else on the chip. Uh, it has DAC, it has capacitive touch, it has a temperature sensor, it has uh, sigma delta modulation output, which is a way to do something kind of like a DAC by doing a very, very high frequency on and off, and then you can filter that to produce a DAC output. It's how, if you've ever heard of Class D amplifiers, it's sort of a similar idea to how they work. There's tons of I.O. Uh, again, ESP8266, kind of annoying sometimes because you only had a few pins. Certain peripherals had to be on certain pins, so you couldn't use all combinations. There's a GPI matrix crossbar, so you can choose where you want to put your pins. Um, you don't have to look at the data sheet necessarily and say, okay, I can only use these two pins for S these three pins for SPI. I, I, so I'm allocating there, you can say, well, I want to use these pins because that's easier or because I want to use that other thing for something else. There's an interrupt matrix as well, which is more of an internal feature to share interrupts between the cores and allocate the interrupts. Lots of flexibility there. There's a lot of ways to plug in, connect things to the ESP32. There's spy bus, four spy buses, which three are fairly easy to use and one of them's tricky. There's uh, Two I2S buses, that's an audio data bus that was on the ESP8266, but it was hard to use. Um, and the I2S has a bunch of extra features, so you can use, kind of uh, misuse it to do some other things. Like there's a demo project where somebody hooked up a camera um, with a parallel interface and read all of the ports through the I2S interface. Uh, there's two hardware I2C buses. I2C is a really common way to connect sensors to a microcontroller. Uh, for example, the IOTAS has, I think, 
an I squared C bus with four things on it, the uh, pressure and temperature and humidity sensor, there's an expander pin, there's uh, an I2S DAC that you configure over I squared C, there's something else that I can't think of right now. Um, yeah, the serial ports, basically all of the I.O. that you could want. Uh, this is starting to sound a little bit like a uh, late night television spill, but there really is more. Uh, a lot of stuff got thrown in here. So there's CAN bus interface for automotive connections. There's um, an infrared transmitter and receiver for talking to sort of, uh, this is supposed to be just for talking to sort of televisions and things like that, sending IR remote codes. But it also kind of happens that what it is is an engine for sending any stream of digital on and off pulses as a stream. And there's actually a whole lot of places that that's useful. So somebody's already taken that remote control interface and worked out a way to drive uh, NeoPixel type WS2812 LEDs from it. So you can just feed in a stream of pulses and program those. And that is a lot easier than on A266 again, where you had to do that with software and software timing, and it was a little bit finickety, or hack one of the other peripherals. Um, there's various ways to make pulses for LEDs and motors. There's an Ethernet interface, so you can have a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Ethernet, Internet of Things device if that's what you want. Um, there's a hall sensor, although I don't think there's software for the hall sensor yet. Uh, a lot of people are asking where can they can get this thing. Uh, if you came along today, then you got the IOTUS board. So you have one already to take home. Uh, you can get them from sort of the usual online places where you bought ESP 8266s. I think a lot of people have had bad experiences with AliExpress and some of the other pre-orders. There were some vendors that took pre-orders and never shipped. Um, but that situation is hopefully over now. Um, so that kind of is a real whirlwind tour of the hardware side. There's just so many features, you kind of can't go into that much depth on them all. Uh, but there's also quite a lot new on the software side, which I think is really exciting. Um, the old ESP8266 had two SDKs. There was a non-OS SDK where you sort of wrote your program kind of like Arduino and you used callbacks to do networking. And there was a real-time operating system one where you could have multiple tasks and they could communicate with each other. And then built on top of those, there were a lot of other ways to program it like Arduino and um, Sming and various other interfaces. The new chip, because it has dual cores already, so it has concurrency always, uses a real-time operating system. Uh, we named, to avoid confusion, we've named that ESP IDF, which is the IoT development framework, really just because we didn't want to have yet another SDK. There were so many SDKs. Uh, it's under the Apache license. Everything above the Wi-Fi layer is open source, so you can go and get it on GitHub. Um, we plan to open source. There's still a few, a few little bits that are still in binary around that because we haven't moved it out yet. But the plan is to really only leave the low-level Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity, which is quite, it's quite chip-specific to begin with um, and quite proprietary in binary. And we want to put the rest under an open source license. And we're using GitHub pretty actively. Um, we push to GitHub from our internal Git servers every couple of days. We accept pull requests. We try to interact with people as best as we can and, and be good uh, GitHub citizens. And there's also a technical reference manual, which was conspicuously missing on A266. So the hardware is actually documented. Uh, there are some chip chapters that are still missing or coming, but it's being added to every month or two. And you can go and look up actually what the peripheral does, what the register map is, all of that information that you didn't get with the ESP8266 necessarily. So use ESP, if you're going to use ESPIDF to program, you have to, how do you actually go about doing this? Um, the chip as you probably realized, is a lot more complicated than the A266. There's lots of stuff. Um, it's not as complicated as Linux hardware, um, but it is a lot more complicated than sort of simple microcontrollers. And the idea is that if you've got good abstractions, then you can program for that without having to know everything down to the base level, and that's our goal. So one of the big ways to do that is FreeRTOS, which is a real-time operating system. Um, real-time operating system is a bit different to a general purpose operating system, but it gives you a framework where you can write programs that talk to each other and share data. Um, you have tasks which are basically the same as threads on a normal operating system um, with some differences in scheduling, but the same general idea that you can have multiple things running concurrently. And in ESPIDF, you can put those on one core or the other core, or you can allow them to be scheduled on whichever core is free. Um, the threads can send data to each other in a sort of safe way through queues. So you push data into queue in one task, you read it in the other task. Um, you can use semaphores and mutexes, which are sort of basic ways to signal between tasks in that way. 
Uh, at the moment, SPIDF only supports free RTOS. There are some other RTOSs coming. Um, at some point in the future, we're going to be able to support other ones. And NUTX, the NUTX operating system, if anybody's interested in this, has a, a support for ESP32 already. You can boot that on NUTX. I think the peripheral support is still a work in progress, but if you're interested in NUTX, check that out. And the other big abstraction, that real-time operating system lets you uh, schedule your tasks and talk to each other and do basic computing. It doesn't really give you anything for interacting to the outside world. It's kind of just a pure uh, computing kind of in set of abstractions. So the other abstraction is drivers. Uh, and ESPIDF has drivers already in it for these peripherals, and other peripherals are more or less on their way. Stuff is landing every couple of days. So most of the major features in hardware have a driver that you can use rather than having to poke at the hardware directly. And also examples. There's plenty of examples there. Um, if you think that there's an obvious bit of functionality that doesn't have an example, let us know and we'll write an example for it. So you can take the example code and play with that. And if you look in the ESPIDF examples directory, that's where the examples of the project are. There are also a bunch of other programming options. Um, if you're brand new to Embedded, then Arduino is very popular and very good and a very, very straightforward way to work with um, microcontrollers, including ASP32. You can uh, also use the Arduino libraries in ESPIDF because they're built on top of it. And that's something that the IOTAS software is using. And I think Mark's going to talk a little bit more about strategies for joining those two together. So you can even take, uh, IOTAS has a couple of Arduino libraries written for the Arduino environment that it just pulls in and uses um, in the ESPIDF environment. So it gives you a way to, to mash things up. There's a MicroPython port that we're going to hear about later this afternoon. Uh, the Node MCU project, which ran Lua on the A266, is up and running on the ESP32. There are a few JavaScript pro projects. I'm not actually across where all of those are at. Um, the bottom two, I put with lines through them because that's my wish list for things I want to run on ESP32. Um, uh, Rust is a very interesting language for embedded. Unfortunately, you can't run Rust unless you have LLVM support for your platform. And Extensor doesn't have LLVM support yet. Um, so hopefully some people will get interested in adding LLVM support for Extensor. And then all kinds of interesting things might happen. Uh, the other one is really more, I don't know anybody else who shares this idea, but I really liked systems programming in Erlang uh, some time ago. And I think that a lot of Erlang concepts map to real-time OS concepts. So someday I want to try to run Erlang on a microcontroller. But uh, that's just putting that out there in case there's any other Erlang fans who want to come and talk to me about it later. So um, yeah, go and jump in. You've got some hardware. Um, there's plenty of people in the room that you can grab if things don't work or if you've got questions. Uh, the documentation is all for IOTAS and for ESPIDF is up there. So let us know what you find. Uh, thanks. I think I've got five minutes for questions if people want to ask anything. Is there a question about bringing the microphone down to you? Anyone questions? Do you have any here I can buy? <laughs> um, I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> but they will be easier to buy soon, I promise. <laughs> uh, what does the modules typically cost? And can you get them um, with on different boards, exposing the um, different pinouts and things like that? Yeah, yeah. The question was, what do the modules typically cost, and what kind of boards can you get available? There are a couple of boards that are developed by Espressive, um, like one called the Core Board and another one called um, SPW Rover that has a screen and a debugging interface on it. Um, the Core Boards you have been for sale through Adifruit, and I think if Trollinx Labs is an Australian seller who's had them. They go in and out of stock pretty fast because people tend to buy them up. I think they're somewhere in the sort of $25 range for the Core Board. Um, the other board with the screen and things like that is up around $50. Um, there's also quite a few third-party vendors popping up on uh, sort of from China, AliExpress and sites like that with similar boards for less money, um, still sort of in the $15 to $20 range at the moment. Yeah. And that gives you something you can put in a breadboard, plug into USB and yeah, go ahead and program. Um, Did you have a question? Uh, I just had a question of time in a bit late. Did it come with an accelerometer or is that not on this one? The IOTAS does have an accelerometer. I don't think it has software support for the accelerometer yet. Uh, so that's a, a work in progress. 
sorry. The Out of Fruit Library is actually in the project. Um, I've actually put a ticket in GitHub. Basically, if someone wants to try and implement it or have a go at it, it's pretty, pretty simple. I've already got a bit of a mock-up doing the same thing, but I just thought I'd throw a couple of other peripherals out there. So the drive is already, or the library is already there. So um, if anyone wants to hack on it the rest of the week, just come hassle me. So uh, it's fantastic that the documentation that's come out with 32, is there, what's the plans for that 8266, I guess in terms, is it going to be a product that's obsolete over time? Was it going to hang around? Because I guess it still has some, there are some uses for it. Is sure. There plan use, well, there are plans for the documentation to come in? There's no plan to obsolete the ESP8266. It'll continue to be available. Um, and there's going to be some updates to the ESP8266 SDK coming. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of large-scale documentation projects that the kind we've done for ESP32. Um, with all the extra functionality, roughly how much extra power use is it versus the ESP8266? Sure. Um, the low, in the low-power sleep mode, the power usage is actually a little bit lower, um, and there's a few more options around flexibility for that. ESP8266, you'd put it to sleep and you'd have to do a full reset. You could store a tiny amount of memory. You still have to do a reset after going to sleep, but you can store more information and you can actually run either the ultra low power processor or a little bit of your own code <coughs> right when you wake up to decide if you need to boot. Um, so you can have more options to architect it in a way that uses less power. Regarding uh, when it's running, whether it uses less power, it does use a little bit more. Um, you can tame it back fairly aggressively if you turn things off, turn the clock speed down, um, that kind of thing. So you can still use some of the features and have a, a still quite good performing but not right out there performing device. I don't have numbers on me right now, but there's some stuff in, there's some numbers in the data sheet that uh, are accurate. So you can check those out. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? We've got another moment. Yep. A little more superficial, but um, can you share the story about how um, was there a particular reason why this one was named the 32 and the old one was the 8266? <laughs> uh, so naming, naming of the chips was before my time, but I do know that at one point, I think I saw a Twitter discussion, uh, John Lee's Espressive Systems Twitter account was asking what should we call the new chip. And I think ASP32 is something somebody suggested, but you'd have to go and dig through Twitter history to, to know that. Okay, any final questions? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Angus.